This episode of This Agile Life has been brought to you by BrilliantAgile.com, providing agile and scrum training, consultancy, and personnel. BrilliantAgile.com. Done right, it's brilliant. Recorded on Monday, November 19th, 2013, in St. Louis, Missouri, This Agile Life, episode 26. Isn't that where they put Richard Simmons? Welcome to This Agile Life, a podcast about what it's like to be agile in the real world. Hello, everyone. I'm the host of This Agile Life, John Sextro, and this evening I have three wonderful hosts that are joining me. From left to right on my Skype video readout, I've got Amos King. Hey, John. How's it going, Amos? The one time it's great to have a first name that starts with A's because I end up on the left on Skype. You think that's how that happened? I think it's alphabetical order. Yeah, I've got... Do you have them in alphabetical order as well? Craig, Jason, John. Wow. Look at that. Skype can alphabetize. I mean, really, if you think about it, why would it randomize? When you can alphabetize. That's right. Let's alphabetize all of the methods in every class that we create. It's a great idea. I hate you. In the, <laughs> in the center square, we have Craig Buchek. Hey, how's everyone doing? Good, Craig. Don't forget do you, the square. Do you remember, uh, what, is that? what was that? Hollywood Squares. That was the name yes. of that. You're in the famous circle uh, center square, Craig. Uh, I am not sure if I'm crazy enough for that. Okay, we'll see. Was, it's a lot to live up to. Wasn't that where they put Richard Simmons? Uh, that's what I just said. I'm not crazy that, enough for that. That's why you're in the center square in mind, Ty. So appropriate, Amos. Thank you. And, of course, the uh, always welcome Jason Tice. How are you, Jason? I'm doing well, John. Well, guys, tonight we are going to be talking about something that... Uh, I've been having quite a few conversations with folks about lately, at least in the past couple of months, and thought it would be useful to get your guys' opinion and go over it. There's a couple of concepts that we use in Agile that I'd like to go over and review and see what you guys think about them. And they are the walking skeleton. We'll talk more about these, of course. Minimal marketable feature and thin vertical slice. Have you guys all heard of these three things? Walking skeleton is a new one on me. Okay. Good. Got some learning to do there for us tonight. Yeah, the article that you're referencing on on vertical slices about testing vertical slices. And it just uh I hadn't really heard it used in that context, really. Yep. I think there's a some some opportunity there to clarify what we mean by all of these things. Jason, what about you? I've used them all, and in particular, I think I seeded the article that talked about the testing paradigm because that's where I've done a lot of coaching where things tend to break down and start to go wrong because there's a lot of challenges when you say, how are you going to decide what to test at the integrated level and then what to test at the unit level? Okay, let me give a, let me give a brief definition for each of these for our listening audience. And then we can talk about them more and see what your opinions are and see how you use them and what you think. I'm going to start at the, at the largest level. And I think the largest level here is the walking skeleton. The idea of a walking skeleton is, I think it's a, it's a pretty good name because it really does give you a visual of a skeleton and he's walking. And it's like the, the most basic thing you could get off the ground and working for your application without building a lot of uh, extra stuff. It's the barest minimum, right? It's touching a database. It's showing something on the, on the web app. It's some middleware, but it touches all of the aspects and all of the tiers of your infrastructure in some small way so that you have just, just enough in each of those infrastructure layers so that you've landed some code there. And that uh, that basically is what the walking skeleton is. It's just a little bit of something in every layer of your architecture. The, uh, the next level down is minimal marketable feature. And this is a thin slice of a feature. This is where we sometimes get some confusion around the difference between minimal marketable feature 
and thin vertical slice. So this is may, where we may start to have some discussion about this, but a, a, th a minimal marketable feature is a small piece of a feature. It's just enough of something to be, as it states in its definition, marketable, something that would be of value to the users and to uh, the product owners. So, John, can I jump in here? Um, yeah. So would a walking skeleton be like the minimum that you need to test out like a deployment? Because you have like a little bit of everything, but not much. And then minimal marketable features really like something that can bring value where, you know, just because you pull the word hello world out of a database and you can get it out to your application and you can deploy your application doesn't doesn't mean it's minimal marketable, but that would be a walking skeleton. Right. So not only okay. not only is it something, Amos, that uh, you can use to test out your deployment, <clears throat> but it also gives you. A, a foothold on on each of your architectural layers, right? Infrastructure layers, if you will, so that you know the database is there, you know the web server is there, and you've touched all of these things because something is deploying and executing on each of those pieces of the architecture. So to so me, it's a good the walking easy. skeleton. The walking skeleton is sort of what you try to get deployed on day one, hopefully, or it's iteration zero. I've also heard that term. It's, um, it's a good good. First win, like yeah. So it's sort of like it's in some ways it's a it's a vertical slice that just is hello world. You know, it's hey, do we have a you know do we have a testing framework? Do we have everything in place and working together integrated? Um, and I have gotten that done in you know a day or two on a couple of projects. Yeah, the idea is you'd get it done as quickly as possible. But one of the things that you mentioned there, Craig, was. Thin vertical slice, which is one of the things that I wanted to discuss around kind of clearly differentiate, differentiating these things for the, our listeners, because I think that there is a lot of confusion around some of these terms out there. I, I would like to, to kind of discuss, like, what do we think belongs in each of these things? Because uh, the I'm, I'm really interested in the walking skeleton, like, like the day one, what, what do you consider to be a walking skeleton? Like, what pieces do you need in place? Because for me, that's CI and a deploy a one button deployment. Mm. And, and, and Amos, I'm going to jump in there too. Uh, actually, kind of springboard on some discussions we had in a recent episode talking about planning. Because one of the things that that they mentioned in the definition here is that the 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 contents of the walking skeleton doesn't need to be everything. But then they say you should be able to deploy it. So. If I truly am going to deploy a feature that doesn't need connectivity to the database, why set that up until you actually need to do that? Oh, I, I would agree. I have very few applications that, that don't require that. I mean, it seems feature. like a, a term that I know was popular in the XP community uh, some time ago, they talked about like iteration zero, where you would do like a, you know, before you start building features, you would do like an infrastructure centric iteration that you would do this. But then it goes into you might be building things that you may or may not need. So I, yeah, I'm actually not fully supportive of the practice unless there's a true need to integrate a piece of the architecture to deliver a feature that the customer or the user actually requested. Well, does walking skeleton say that you need to add a database in order to have a walking skeleton? Or is that no. walking skeleton kind of I, defined by the team? I think I've done it both ways. Um, I've done a couple walking skeletons. Mm -hmm. One had the database because we knew we needed you know, in iteration one, basically. Um, the other one had a database that we knew would need, and but we didn't go to deployment because it was sort of we a talked about small it. slice of a bigger, a much bigger application, and we were doing an agile transformation, so we just wanted to get a win and get something working and uh, CI working, really. Continuous integration with uh, uh, one of the CI servers. Um, and then another one, uh, like Amos talked about, sometimes you want to not do a database until the last responsible moment. So your your walking skeleton at that point would not have a database, um, but you know you'd be able to do the one button deploy and uh, with all the continuous integration and testing frameworks all in place. Without getting too crazy about planning and and uh, building things that you aren't going to need. 
I think that it's we're, we could all probably agree that for the most part, you could guess at a few of the critical layers that are going to okay, exist. So, so what what would be your minimal thing, no matter the project? What would be your walking skeleton? I don't think I could. I don't think I could give you a walking skeleton, no matter the project, because it would be different if it was a mobile app, if it was a web app, if it was a a desktop app. So I think that those would all be different to me. For me, it's CI and one button deploy. But what are you deploying then? Doesn't doesn't matter. Okay, so that's your be able to push code out the door. I want to be able to do it in one button, whether that's one button that compiles it and puts it on a CD so I can hand carry it next door, or whether it is pushing it onto a phone, like compiling and pushing it onto a phone, or or pushing it out to a web server. I don't care what it is. I want a CI and a one button deploy. Okay, so that's so a very really nice to have world. CI deploy it. <laughs> that's that's what I want in a hello world. Go ahead, Craig. Yeah, that's that's what I just said. Is he's basically, he'd rather just have Hello World in his framework and uh, whatever application deployment he's going to be doing. I think that's a good goal, but I, uh, per the definition of walking skeleton, and I uh, I respect your opinion, Amos, but that's not what the walking skeleton would be in terms of the definition of walking skeleton. Yeah, see, to me, what, what the walking skeleton is based upon is having some semblance of a target architecture for your system that you know what all those components are, you've identified those building blocks, and you simply do the integration ahead of time because integration is hard. So like we talked about in a prior episode, don't put that off, do it soon, feel the pain, get through those challenges, and then move on. Yeah, there's learning yeah. that can occur there because you learn about what it takes to get something deployed into the database, deployed onto an application server, deployed onto a web server, et cetera, et cetera. It's all, you're, you're taking these steps of learning something, Craig, you mentioned, and Jason did as well after you mentioned it, Craig, though first, iteration zero, um, that that's a, that's a time of learning and that's a time of reaching out and putting some tentacles into all the parts of your infrastructure to understand what that's all about. The other thing I think that's unique, John, that's, there, there's a process component of this too that I, I throw out there and you can shoot it down if it's not relevant for discussion here. Suppose you're deployed into a managed deployment model. So if you're doing mobile and you're deploying to, you know, you have to deploy within a master device management pr- plan where you may not control your actual deployment because someone else does it. How does that impact this? So where, when do you say I'm done with the walking skeleton, you could declare success and move on if you don't truly control your full release pipeline. The walk- yeah, that's one of the situations I talked about earlier where we didn't control that and it was a much larger application and it was going to take probably months to get just our little piece deployed. So we basically had our CI and we had a staging box and that's as far as we could get on our own, on our team. Um, and if you're going to have roadblocks outside your team that you can't control, that's about all you can hope for. So, Craig, in that environment, and I apologize, I, as we're trying our new, uh, our new conference scene with Skype, um, I got booted off and had to come back in, so I think I missed some of your comments. But what's the role of the team in that? So the team identifies the roadblock, the team engages with the party, and then you guys go on, but how do you ensure you can still be successful and not lose track of that? Um, I think that's a, that's a risk. Um, but sometimes you have to go to war with the army you have, not the army you want, right? Um, yeah, I agree. I agree totally. So you, know, so. you have to deal with the facts on the ground. Um, and th- those were the facts on the ground in that case. Um, just getting everything to um, a staging server, though, within two days was just astounding to these people who had never done any agile. So uh, we had a win on, on day two, basically. Um, and then we built on top of that, you know, we had functionality by day three or four. Um, so I, I think you can still get a win out of it, even if you don't go all the way to production, especially if you've got a complicated environment and external factors. It would be, it would be awfully 
it would be awfully aggressive to assume that you can somehow get your walking skeleton into production. I'm not saying that you can't do it, but just because you couldn't or were not able to get it, your walking skeleton to production doesn't mean that it's not worth doing it. There's still a lot of valuable things that can go on and occur by going through the exercise of building the walking skeleton. And Jason, you were asking about the walking skeleton and the life of the walking skeleton. Hopefully the walking skeleton eventually turns into, you know, Mr. Full-Fledged, fleshed-out application. And you may only put the skeleton together with so many pieces at first because you wait until the last responsible moment to make certain architectural decisions. And then at that point, you do a little bit of surgery to Mr. Walking Skeleton and give him the extra arm or the extra brain that he needs to be uh, the new version of Mr. Walking Skeleton. Yeah, and I think, I think building out what I mentioned earlier, John, it's this idea, and Amos can, actually Amos can chime in here, because I like the idea of having a vision of what system components you're going to use, but at that juncture, don't integrate them until you actually have a feature that requires them. So maybe you've got a roadmap. You say, okay, for, to be successful on this for this release, we know we're going to have to wire all this stuff together. But we've, our product owner has identified a group of features that we can put out to production, and we may we may not need to integrate that that fifth component. And we could do that in the next you know the next iteration if desired. So, uh, or as you learn more things, you may find out that that wasn't the right technology choice to integrate anyway. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, the risk that I see here uh, with the walking skeleton pattern is that it could it could start to create cookie cutter solutions. So if you're in an organization and they say, "Hey, this is just the way we do it," and guess what? The next thing you know, you have an application where they they bootstrap from another project and they come integrated with components that they may or they may not need. And then how do you clean that up over time? That's just something to lose track. Of. That's something to, to ensure you don't lose track of. It's an interesting point there, Jason, and the idea would be, and I don't know if you were alluding to this, but the idea isn't that everyone uses the same walking skeleton. Was that what you were meaning? Well, I'm saying that's the risk, that if you're, you know, if you're in an environment where you're collaborating, and I, I know, you know, in our recent discussion about planning, you know, Amos talked a lot about the need to communicate. So you're on a team and you hear, oh, hey, this other team, they came with an 80% solution. Or actually, maybe let's call it a 120% solution, and you decide to borrow it for your project. Well, if you borrow their solution and then start to refactor it, be careful that you're not bringing over things that you may not need for what your project is. That's interesting. It might um, might not be a bad idea to think about borrowing a walking skeleton, but I would expect that the majority of the teams should, as part of their iteration, go through the process of building their own walking skeleton. Craig Buchek, what do you you think? Yeah, I I don't think that you'd basically take someone else's app post-sale and and cut a few pieces out and call that your walking skeleton. I think you you might take their walking skeleton and use it as your own. Um, Actually, with Rails, I kind of am at that point. uh, Rails has something called a template. Um, so I've got a template that pulls in all the gems, all the, the libraries that I typically need. And I actually, you'd even ask me, you need this library, this library, this library for that project. So I can create a walking skeleton and have it deployed in a couple of hours. Um, so, but I, if I'm not sure if I need a database, I won't even put the database in there like Amos was talking. The point of walking skeleton is minimal. You want to get out there fast. It doesn't. It doesn't even matter if you have all the pieces. You know, if your skeleton doesn't have a heart and it doesn't have muscles and it doesn't have a brain, that's kind of the point. You just want it to function uh, to have something that you can see. It doesn't have to even have a minimal marketable feature. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be anything but Hello World. You missed, did you want to add on to that? Um, I think that, yeah, you just, you want to get a quick win and get it out the door. And I, I don't know that any of us are in any any uh, debate about whether that's a good thing or not. Uh, Craig, you mentioned Rails and how it gives you this ability to get a walking skeleton going very quickly. I think that I can see that. I understand the framework and believe that that's true. There are cases where your your environment and your needs may be significantly more complex. You, na- you may need uh, a messaging you, you may need to touch on a 
messaging sort of system. You may need database. You may need, I don't know, lots of other stuff, web services that uh, you couldn't just whip out through some scaffolding sort of commands in in Rails, right? Actually, these you can. Uh, That Rails, it's just such a great framework. I can't can't say (laughs) enough good things about it. Actually, I'll plug something else um, called uh, Suspenders. I believe it's my thought about it. I'll put that in the show notes. Uh, It's basically the same idea. It's a Rails app with add-ons, and you just pick your add-ons, and you get... You know, you probably have a message queuing system. You probably have a backend database and an object relation mapper, and and it's all there, uh, and you can get it deployed in an hour or two. Very cool. And sometimes it even comes with some deployment script. Yep. Usually. Then, how do you guys view walking skeleton and and uh, differentiate walking skeleton from, say, minimal marketable feature? for the sake of our discussion here tonight. I think that's pretty easy. So walking skeleton is, is iteration zero. A minimal marking feature would not be iteration zero. It would be anything after that. So there's actually two related things. Minimal viable product, which is a, a few features um, that you basically need to launch your site to the world or maybe to a beta. Um, but a minimal marketable feature is a single feature within a set of features. Um, and um, so you have your walking skeleton. It, it basically has zero features. Um, and then you add your first minimal feature. Um, and we can talk about what makes a feature minimal and why you want to do that. Jason Tice, what do you think is, what do you think, uh, a minimal marketable feature should consist of? Well, actually, I was going to respond to the last question, which was kind of sure. talking about what constitutes, how do you differentiate the skeleton from the MMF? And in that juncture, uh, from one of our prior discussions, there's actually been some discovery work done with metrics specific to business value, which when I looked at them, there's, they start to look like story points all over again. But it's this idea of some way that people are starting to say, you know, this is how much value this feature provides to the business. If your walking skeleton has um, has feature points associated with it, because it, it delivers business value, I think it needs to go on a diet. So in that juncture, that's a way to clarify what is a skeleton and what is not. Um, at that juncture, an MMF should be something that provides full capability business functionality to the user. So it needs to get data. It needs to present the data as needed. It needs to use the services and whatever you know security constraints you might have in place. It needs to be ready to ship. Make sense? Can they can they be the same thing? If if it's that simple for your minimal marketable feature to go out the door, could that be your your skeleton? To be true to the definition of the skeleton, I think not. I think a skeleton really should have little bit little if no business value. It's really about wiring together the bare minimum of the system level components you need to make the system work. But if I'm required to go out of my way in order to create a skeleton instead of a minimal marketable feature, does that make, does that mean that I shouldn't have a skeleton or are they this one in the same? And with that instance, I, I think they're different because I think there's inherently more effort involved in building a feature versus building the skeleton. I tend to agree with that, Jason. Uh, also, I would say to Amos's question about could a minimal marketable feature also be the walking skeleton, I would say that there are going to be plenty of examples of minimal marketable features that could be candidates for touching all of the layers that you would touch when you create the walking skeleton. But when you're in iteration zero, and maybe Craig can attest to this, you may not be in the position in iteration zero to develop your first minimal marketable feature. Craig, what do you think? Yeah, I I would agree with that. So basically, get your technology in line before you start your first feature. That's what the walking skeleton in iteration zero is about, is, is to get your technology stack working. And provably work, and that's well, to me all the walking skeleton is. Well, the one thing that I think I see it mentioned here a little bit, and, and I guess I learned it, Craig, as a kind of an iteration zero concept is 
There is a strong learning component. So, I mean, if you're using like a new data store that you've never used, uh, there's a value to that. And there's a value for the team that's going to do the work that I think we, we might be skipping over here. Really to say that, you know, use that walking skeleton to kind of, it's not a spike, but do some learning so that when you start building features, you're, you really, you know what you're doing and you can perform. I agree that uh, with what you're saying, Jason, especially around the technology stack, getting the technology stack kind of built, and it at least establishes a runway for you on your technology stack so that you can start to deploy and, uh, and deliver. Uh, Amos, back to your point about the minimal marketable feature as a walking skeleton, I think if you, do, if you are in a position where you could develop a minimal marketable feature as your walking skeleton, then I would tell you to go for it. If I if I can get log in in a day, might as well. Log in could be a minimal marketable feature, uh, but I would doubt that as a result of building log in, I don't think you would end up with a walking skeleton. I I could go either way on that. Um, the skeleton you may consider uh, the log in part of your technology stack. Um, yes, you may. Or, or you may have some customization. So if it's basically something off the shelf um, that you're pretty certain you're going to want, then, then I'd call that part of the skeleton. Um, but if there's some custom way you want to happen, then, then I'd probably call it a, a minimal marketable feature. But I, I don't think it matters that much where you draw that line. Um, it's just that a minimal marketable feature is something that has business value. and the walking skeleton is something that just has technical value to get started. I, I mainly just don't want people going in and saying, oh, wait, we can't do that because it's not a walking skeleton. We have to have that first. I think that a walking skeleton is fantastic, but let's make sure that we don't say that we have to have this to move forward. I would like to propose to teams that if you're struggling with where to start, then a walking skeleton is a good place to start. Amos, if, if you have a, a higher performing group or if you have a, a project where there's, there's some more runway in terms of what functionality you're going to be delivering and you can start working on features right away, then I say, you know, skip past, consider, think about maybe skipping past a bare bones walking skeleton and go for something that adds a little more value uh, because you can do it. You know, you you have some more information and you can do that. But for a team that's struggling to get out of the gate, starting with a walking skeleton can be something to help build some good momentum and get you on the right path towards continuous delivery. And the one thing that I wanted to add to that is uh, walking skeleton is a very, I'd call it, it's definitely a technical practice. So if you're a team, you're building software, you're working with a product owner, that product owner is working with business stakeholders. Make sure that everyone's aware of what you're doing, since if, if those stakeholders have been coached, that they're going to see business capability deployed you know, at, the end of every, at the end of every iteration or every release. Make sure they understand that a walking skeleton may not necessarily provide business capabilities. Right. That's a good yeah. point. And, and so a business skeleton may be part, just a part of your iteration zero, too. I mean, like I said, I've usually gotten it done in you know, a couple hours or a couple days, and our iterations on the couple day project was still a week or two. Sure. So, so even though we had that skeleton in place, it wasn't it wasn't a deliverable. I, I think that's what you we're getting caught up on. Uh, the walking skeleton is not a deliverable. It's just a step to get you in the right direction quicker. Get yeah, the juices I, flowing. Yeah, yeah, I agree to totally. I've just said. I think John, you. You might have been in these, but I have been in these in these coaching scenarios where there's a technical project going on, or and there's due to a breakdown of communication, somebody thinks that oh, this this should be shippable. This is a full release. This is actually going to do something that provides business value, and it doesn't. And so, what I'm encouraging teams to do is to ensure that their stakeholders have some awareness of what they're doing, so they understand the value. 
but they also stand, they also understand this is not going to be the, the beta version of our release. It's, it's just to get the juices flowing. I, I have been in that situation, Jason. I know what you're talking about. Again, I think that an important part of the walking skeleton is for teams, new teams, they're coming together, they're feeling out the, the rest of the people on the team, figuring out where they fit on the team. They're, there's a lot of learning typically that goes on with a team during iteration zero. And Craig made an excellent point. I mean, a walking skeleton is in and of itself not a shippable, it's not a minimal viable product, right, Craig? It's something that you do. Yeah. yeah, it's something that you it's something that you do to kind of just get the get yeah. the development juices flowing. You might consider it a milestone, but maybe maybe it's milestone zero. Ooh, a milestone, yuck. Yeah, yeah but it's a, it's a point in time where you can say, "Hey, we've accomplished something." That's that's all I mean by that. Yeah. Well, it actually, I would take it a step further, maybe even try to call it it call, call it what it is. It's an engineering di- rigor or an engineering discipline. And what it is, is the ability to abstract out your base level end-to-end systems architecture that makes your application work. And you can abstract that out and manipulate it and maintain it separate from any business capability on top of it. Okay. I'm I'm going to invoke another uh, principle. This meeting has gone too long. It's time to move to a new topic. Wait wait a second, because I have a bad pun. So if it's... it's, (laughs) Well, it's definitely going on too long. If it's en- in, if it's engineering, no if it's engineering rigor and it's a walking skeleton, is it engineering rigor mortis? Oh, uh, wow! Uh, that sounds like a Tice joke. <laughs> well, everyone here is Ouch. an enterprise architect. You guys just don't know it. Whatever. Okay, so uh, so Amos has declared that the the walking skeleton conversation has passed its. Um, valuable lifetime. I, I think Craig, I have to check out. I think Craig could have implemented a walking skeleton at the time we're talking about it. So move on. Okay. All right. Let's move on. Let's get back to minimal marketable feature. Have you guys? You guys are some skilled agilists, I would say. Do you guys actually practice minimal marketable feature, or is this something that sort of has come? started to become second nature for you and you don't even really think about it. I would say I try, um, but the business interests usually um, want the features to be less minimal. Um, so the, the idea of the minimal market, that's feature because is, all, all 15 C level executives want to put their piece in. Well, yeah, but, <laughs> The idea behind a minimal marketable feature is it, it, it comes from, I believe it comes from the, the lean uh, methodologies. The idea is to get the basics out there in front of your customers and then iterate quickly to see how they use that feature. Um, and then you can enhance it. So instead of having the perfect feature, you do just enough to make it useful to them, see how they use it. And then perfect it as you go. I I try to I try to do it all the time, like to to practice it. But um, I I I would say that it's easier now than it used to be to even realize what a minimal marketable feature is, and to be able to sell that to the customer to say, hey, look, we don't need all of this. Let's go with this, and to tell them the reasons why. And the more that I, I come up with like what is the minimal marketable feature out of a giant feature, the simpler it becomes to sell to people because I think I, I pick the right place now compared to what I did at the beginning. The other thing that's going on from a methodology perspective is there's some neat mashups going on between story mappings and different levels of MMFs. So this idea of saying here, here's an MMF and it has these stories that support it and that gives us a basic level of capability. It almost goes back to what you were talking about in a prior episode, you missed that, that criteria for how you could group your features, like showstoppers or whatever that was, I forget it, but uh, a way to say that, okay, to get the first level done, you got to do these stories, and then at a higher level of the story map, there's another feature that's built on, and you've got the story breakouts to do that, and from that, you can really manage progress and where a team is 
in terms of building towards an ultimate goal that is comprised of multiple features. So you're using the MMF for a, a higher level planning strategy, and I try to use the MMF to say, hey, let's get feedback before we go plan any further. One of the, thing, one of the <laughs> things that I would like to use, what I would like to propose with minimal marketable feature is that, yes, it's a planning tool, but I also think that it's something that teams evolve to. I think it's a tough subject, and I think that thin, both thin vertical slice and minimal marketable feature are one of these things that take a team from good to great. Craig. So, so interestingly, Amos and I worked on a project previously together, um, and we, we came to use minimal marketable features to meet timelines, actually. It was, it was kind of interesting. So the customer has this big feature in mind, and it's, you know, it's all fancy and all fleshed out. And we're like, okay, you've asked for more than we can fit in in your timeline. Um, so we're actually going to give you a more minimal feature than you asked for. We're going to give you all the features you asked for, but they're going to be more minimal. They're not going to be as fancy as you, you asked for. Um, and it's going to save us time. We're going to get it out to the customers quicker, like you were hoping, in, in the time that you were hoping to. Um, so we're still meeting your deadlines, but we're not going to do as much because we know that a lot of, if we did everything you were looking to do, we'd have to rework a lot of it anyway. And we wouldn't so hit that deadline. You did see, you Craig, did hit, you Craig, did hit the deadline. I, and see, Craig, that's where I would say that's where I've seen these te teams do this this kind of evolution of MMFs with a story map, and they take those those you know really business defined features, they decompose them into different levels of complexity. They focus on the, the basic first, and then they can reassess to see you know what's relevant for those other elements, and maybe the business changes where you don't do the more advanced layers, but you can manage stakeholder expectations with that type of a, that type of a mindset. Exactly. Yeah, and also make sure that you're providing business value. You know, you're providing the maximum business value with that first minimal feature. Um, and then, you know, if, if they want those other nice to haves, they kind of have to justify them as, you know, your next minimal marketable feature on top of that. Um, so they tend to be smaller than they tend to be, more constrained in their their what they're asking for. I agree, Craig, and that's the part that I think takes a good team and makes them great. So, Craig, what you said was that you used it as you called it a tactic to deliver on a feature and to meet a timeline, a tight timeline. <clears throat> I think if you start off with minimal marketable features, it's easier to get to where product owners and business folks want to be so that you have you have more minimal marketable features that you've pushed out and there's less of a push by the business for a date and there's less of a push for the business to um to deliver the full feature that they're asking for because they're getting those small increments of the feature on a regular basis and now Here's the power of minimal marketable feature is that they can say that's good enough. That's enough. Don't build the whole exactly. giant feature that I asked for because you built just enough. Yes. Oh, and, and Call for applause. Amos King has applause. held hey. up the applause card. Um, yeah, like every time I've been able to implement this successfully and to get a client to buy into it, we've never had to go back and implement that full like original thought out feature. Uh, and we've ended up with a nicer, smaller tool that work better, work faster and, and customers were more happy with. And a lot of times we made changes before we would have even gotten to that big feature to where it wasn't the same feature that they'd originally picked. And yeah, we just, we need to make sure that we're pushing that with our customers. Okay, is that it on minimal marketable so, feature? One, one quick point. So I think I think what we're saying here is that we use it as a tool to push our customers to be more agile, to, to accept that agility that we've been trying to get them to accept. Um, by, by being more minimalist in our first 
um, feature set, we're more agile. We're able to react better. Um, and I also want to talk real quick about if it's my own project, if I'm the project owner, um, I tend to, um, well, the, the point of the minimal marketable product is to, or a feature is to get uh, features out quicker and, and, and iterate faster. And so it's, it's, I guess in the same way, it's, it's a way to get business value out in front of customers fast. Do you find it harder to do if you're the product owner? Um, no, I don't, I don't think so, but you know, I kind of come from that mindset already. I've seen it work. So I think that's why, um, and I, and I've read things about minimal viable products and minimal marketing features. So I know that they have power. I find that it takes me longer to decide what the minimal marketable feature is whenever I have, whenever I'm the product owner. Um, Partially because I think I'm I'm too overexcited about the vision of the end of the product to actually see all the little pieces separately. Yeah, and, and I'm missing the possible flaws that I see when I'm on the engineering side, That's and somebody so brings me a big thing, and I say, "Yeah, yeah, this is a hard point. This is a hard point. This is a flaw, and we shouldn't really do it." But I'm not ready to tell you that yet because you're not ready for that knowledge. So here's where we fi- define the minimal feature. I think especially, and that's even more so with minimal viable products. So basically it's the minimal set of features you can go to, to production with real customers with, with beta, uh, beta or production. Um, I think that's tough. I think minimal viable product is um, a goal that you, that you probably aren't going to really reach. Um, you're probably going to have more than the minimal features in there that you could have sold. Probably. Amos, I wanted to follow up on your point and ask you if you were, if your, if your difficulty with minimal marketable feature is if you really, if you really probe into it, isn't it based on fear? Um, I, I think so. I, I think a lot of it is, um, I, so when someone else tells me about their, idea their product i want to give them the best possible solution for their money in the end but i i am i'm from an outside objective and Mm -hmm. when i'm inside and it's all in my head it's not a it's not a two minute process to come up with it i don't just listen to it and then come out with a minimal marketable feature i end up writing tons of stuff and making outlines and and all kinds of things in order to come up with with what I feel is is a good MMF, um, but that kind of leads to the question also of as things move on and technology moves on, does a minimal viable product take more? Take you more. You have to have more. more feet, like you have user expectations now on the way things behave, where you might have been able to get away with a, an oh. input field that I just type something in and hit enter and it goes now you have to have an input field that also has some autocomplete drop down and a mobile app to go along with it right is does that <laughs> do you, are are we getting to a point where minimal as time goes on does the minimal viable product grow like does it get larger because it has to what do you guys because think of competition is that what yes. you're I, yes. I would say no well, not not because... just competition but like what a user expects if a user expects a certain behavior from a text field and you don't give it to them. I've actually got a good example. Um, So square has now something called square cash. Um, And it's a way it's, it's sort of a replacement for PayPal. Um, And it's more minimal. It's, it's easier. You know, there's, there's less steps involved than PayPal. Um, So I think they've found a, a more minimal feature set then PayPal that does basically the same thing. Um, and it, it cuts through a lot of uh, process. So I think they've basically found an awesome minimal marketable product in square cash. That's more minimal than anything it competes with. You know what, Craig, I will, I will challenge that and say that that's actually more of a product with less. And the reason why I say that is because 
making something simpler and easier to use is often more difficult, right? Well, that's that's what MVP is is to is to pare it down to the minimum, <laughs> right? You know what? How how simple can we make this and still sell it? That's the like I said, it's it's a goal that you're probably not going to reach, but that's the idea behind the whole thing. That's the old thirty seven signals approach that we're going to we're going to steal market by by giving you fewer features. Exactly. But we'll, but we'll give you the most important features, and they'll be beautiful and usable and and excellent. And you and just I don't think, have to go through fifteen menus to get to that. Yeah. Point. And Amos, I think that's kind of what you were saying, though, <clears throat> in terms of the beauty of something, in terms of the expectations that product owners and users have today with with something like Rails, where you can you can type some scaffolding commands and and crap out a beautiful looking web app with very little effort. Jason Tice. So I, w- I want to challenge my friend Amos here. And actually, because you mentioned, and this is not an attack about the thinking comment you just made, but you mentioned that you like to think a lot about how to make things simpler so as to really support an MVP idea. What types of things do you think about to facilitate that process? Oh, okay. So, um, what parts of this goes back to the things from that I picked from a recent episode of the the buckets of features? As you you have showstoppers, which are features you have to have. You have one or two. um, uh, I don't remember the name now. uh, Like big features that that that's your market drive driving market reason that you're going to be over someone else. The killer features. And then, you, and then everything else is a distraction. Okay. So, so if you so, compare it down to those, and then you start going through those, you have just the top two, you got rid of all the distractions, and you say, okay, from these features, is there any way that I can break them into smaller sets? And are, are what's hard, what's not? Um, to implement um, both engineering-wise, you need to look at that value, like how much time is this going to take? And how much value do you think that is to the end customer and keep, keep going down and down until it's, it really is something that you could probably produce in, in a matter of days. Okay. And just to confirm then that's an activity that you're doing kind of acting as a product owner, but I'm assuming you are getting some feedback from the business. Yes. Uh, so I, I, a lot of times whenever someone comes to me with, with a feature, um, a lot of this, like paring it down and everything happens in my head very quickly. And I say, well, what about this? I say, I can deliver this in a couple days. It will, the, your overall idea is going to take a long time, but I can do this in a couple days. What do you think? And then go back and forth with them on that. Um, and then even the back and forth, usually they come back with another feature that's not quite what their original one was. And it may have other things added onto it. And again, I pare it down in my head and we keep going back and forth until we end up at something that we can produce in a couple of days. Well, I think it's, I think again, this is the swim lane I live in, you guys know. I think the important thing to not lose track of about these MVP discussions is that they are very business value centric. And so, well, there's a lot of discussions and there's probably a lot of awesome opportunities that may evolve from a creative or from an innovation team. Ensure that the business is validating what has been proposed as an MVP to ensure that it aligns to their expectations. It would be ill-advised to go off and do that in a vacuum and not keep your stakeholders informed as to what you're doing and then come back with a product which doesn't align to their expectations. Guys, we're running short on time, but I'd like to, I would like to uh, try to wrap up by asking you if you feel like there's a difference between minimal marketable feature and a thin vertical slice. Jason Tice, what do you think? Yes, uh, a significant difference, John. A, I, in my opinion, a thin vertical slice is something that should touch every component of your system architecture. So all the way up and down the stack. A minimal marketable feature does not necessarily have to involve all elements of the stack. So in your definition, Jason, uh, the thin vertical slice is more akin to a walking skeleton. Uh, 
to me, it's, it's a, it's, it would be a criteria that you could classify a story by. So I have a story or I might even have a feature. Does To build this feature based upon the current state of my application or my system, do I have to do something that touches all of the layers? Or am I simply doing something that's only in the app tier or is only in the data tier? Okay. Uh, Craig, what do you think? Um, are they the same so or are they different? I think a thin vertical slice is is how to write your code to address your, your stories. So when you have a new feature um, and a set of stories, you want to write those, you want to address those features in a top-down manner um, that tests your entire stack. So basically you make your stories narrow, um, but tall. Basically tall meaning go th- they go through the entire stack when you test them, and narrow meaning that it, it does um, a minimal amount of things. Okay, so, so they're, they're related but not the same. You equate a, a thin vertical slice to the uh, the chopping up of maybe a minimal marketable feature into very thin vertical slices that are engineering stories. They touch maybe all layers of, of your yeah, your... depending on how you slice it up, the whole feature might be the the that that slice, or it, it may be stories. Sometimes you you chop the stories up into small enough pieces that sometimes they're not the full slice because they'll just you know add things to the database and and not the whole thing. So um, at least the feature would probably be a, a thin slice, maybe your stories, depending on how you break things up. Amos, anything to add to that? Um. Or did you fall asleep? You just said something interesting, and I think that it's a, a much larger discussion than what we have time for, was um, that you talked about engineering stories. And and I, I think that your minimal marketable feature should be your story. It, it, you, should, you should be striving to get them small enough that that can be something deployable and out the door. Ah, interesting. So we should, we should swing back around and, and continue that discussion, Namus. So take a note that... Uh, we need to we need to swing back around because I feel like, similar to Craig, uh, I feel like a thin vertical slice is a story. It's a story that focuses on many layers of the architecture and the technology stack. Uh, I think it. I think many thin vertical slice stories make up a minimal marketable feature, and I think the reason for having <coughs> stories that are thin vertical slices is to avoid this very common practice that I see in especially corporate IT where developers want to uh, work on particular component layers and only those particular component layers. For instance, you have a guy that's, he's just a database guy. He works only on stories related to the database component layer. Or well, I, I think that's a, that's a lot. A uh, fault of calling things layers and and thin vertical slices through the layers is that everybody pictures this tier and they want to stay in one tier. Yep. So we should. It, I think it also drives architecture and what people do because they have that stuck in their head. Well, we should definitely maybe address this in one of our upcoming episodes to dive a little bit deeper into thin vertical slice. Okay, guys, that's the end of our discussion section tonight. We are out of time for discussion, but we are we have plenty of time left to go over and do our newly governless picks section where you can have as many picks as you'd like. And since Jason Tice has been relatively quiet this episode, let's let Jason go first with his picks tonight. Shit. Really? I was sharing <laughs> the airspace. So No, that's cool. Yeah, we appreciate that, Jason. So two things to blo- two things to unplug tonight. Um, first and foremost, uh, for those that are in the St. Louis metro area, uh, we're going to have an Agile Gravy conference coming up in spring in the spring of 2014. The date is April 10th, 2014. It's in West St. Louis County. Uh, it's actually being organized by a nonprofit group. So um, we'll put the uh, it's agilegravy.com if you want to sign up. They're looking for presenters, people to share stuff. So come out and check it out. I have proposed that we should, uh, from this Agile Life, maybe I'll get together at the bar at the Marriott 
and do a live event of some something to do with the conference. So we'll we'll figure something out. It'll be fun. So I that's coming. We up. should do a live recording. A live recording, yeah. Q and A from the audience. Something I don't know. We'll figure it out. A so. live drunk recording. I didn't say drunk. Darn. I I proposed the bar as a, an open space that anyone can come to. Yeah. So they may or may not have beverages. Um, also, a blog that I was following today, I thought it was interesting. Someone who I'm gonna I'm gonna reach out to, uh, Craig Roth. He's a Gartner analyst. We'll put his blog URL in the show notes. Uh, but interesting discussion, and he um, uh, recently talking about things like uh, enterprise attention management. Interesting idea. Uh, cat herding. Um, interesting idea. But um, as someone who has been with other people who use those terms and does a lot of those things um, myself in my day-to-day activities, I find it it's, it's nice to know there are other people out there doing that type of work. So um, an interesting blog to follow with some interesting topics that Craig is discussing. That's all I've got. I'm jealous of Gartner analysts because I think that they get paid for sitting around and making mountains out of molehills and coming up with these very esoteric things to decide that they're a problem within companies and organizations. Great. Now he'll never be a guest. And uh, Agilus <laughs> and, and John, Agilus like us don't do the same. Oh, I'm d- not saying that. I just don't get paid for it. <laughs> Craig Buchek, what are your picks tonight? Uh, my pick tonight is something called Nitrous IO. It's a uh, online IDE. Uh, I haven't uh, used it myself yet, but uh, if you think uh, an online ID might be something useful to you, this is pretty awesome looking. Uh, and my other picks are just things I've mentioned uh, during the show. And we'll have all of those picks in our show notes. I'm going to go next, Amos. You get to be last. Woo! Do you hate email? Yes. Boy, I know I do. Uh, so the other day I heard somebody talking about this solution, if you hate email, it's something called SaneBox.com, S-A-N-E-B-O-X.com. And it's a way to try and get your email under control. I'm trying it out right now. The, uh, the results aren't quite in yet for me as opposed to, uh, to state, to give it a full seal of approval from me. But I'm trying it out, seeing what I think of it, and uh, encourage you to take a look. Try it too, SaneBox.com. And see, John, to show that we think so much alike that this blog from Gartner, from Craig Roth, he actually has a whole blog post on ways to get your inbox under control. So these are real problems, actually, that real people are trying to solve. If the email's more than a week old, highlight it and delete it. There you go. (laughs) Done. From from your mouth to God's ears. You're you're probably not going to answer it anyway. Amos King, what are your picks or pick tonight? Uh, um, no, I, ha- I have three, and uh, I actually give no links or anything like that. Uh, they're, they're more ideas. Uh, well, one of them is a product. Um, automated user acceptance testing, uh, do it. It defines you're done, and it makes people happy. It makes me happy, and that's all yes. the people that matters. Um, <laughs> code retreat. Uh, you know, there, there's uh, CodeRetreat.com, I think, where they, they do some things. But you know what? Just get some guys together or girls and, or girls and guys um, or all we call people, any any combination. Um, yeah, so get people together. Uh, well, in case you know some aliens that code, you may get them to um, get some people together and just spend a weekend and just write code for fun and and try to expand your mind and, and do it in ways that you wouldn't normally do it. And then the last one is Alfred. I don't know if this has been picked before. I love Alfred. It's a tool for Mac. Um, and, and it does everything. So just go, go look at it and get it. Um, yeah. I love Alfred. And if you ever looked at my uh, doc in Mac, you would find that there are no icons in my doc except the icons for apps that are currently running. That's mine. Uh, I insist, I insist, Amos, that we have a This Agile Life code retreat. I think that we should have a, a code and record retreat. We could have it in beautiful St. James, Missouri. That's right. I've got a cabin. We'll go there and hang out. Do you have Wi-Fi? Uh, no. 
I think you kind of need that for a code retreat. No, you don't. Huh. Done it before. It's awesome. It's even better. You have to bring everything you need, and if you don't have it, you have to build it. Well, if you That's would like I mean. to get, get out of your comfort zone, don't have the internet, don't have your documentation, just write code and use each other. But what about the architecture principle of A, B, C? Adopt, well, then buy know which, before you create. I know which Agile Life host we're not inviting to the code retreat. <laughs> Zing! <laughs> I, uh, I'll show up with my evil frameworks and prescriptive guidance. and He's going he's gonna to have a weekend-long Gantt chart. Remember when he used to have the, uh, the, the evil enterprise architect hat? Yeah, I, I don't know what that. happened to it. We should bring that back. So if you wanna yeah. if you wanna participate in the This Agile Life code retreat, tweet us on Twitter at This Agile Life or Amos, where else can they get in touch with us? On the uh, free we node. We are included in IR we have an IRC room in free node pound this agile life. Uh like John said, you can find us on Twitter or on our website, this And where can people find out more about you, Amos? I am found all over the internet as Adcron, A-D-K-R-O-N, on both GitHub and Twitter. And my my ugly blog, as always, is dirtyinformation.com. And now I can't put a design in it because it being ugly has become a thing. What about uh, our ratings on pot, uh, on iTunes, oh, Amos? Oh, yes. And don't forget to rate us on iTunes. We've, we've got six. I'm really happy out there. Three of you wrote reviews. Thank you, Andy, and uh, I can't remember the other two. I'm really sorry. We'll give Have you. A look. We'll give you shout outs <laughs> next time. Okay. Very oh, good. Uh, ben Pomeranke, Andy, and the other guy had some name that I think he just made up to do the review. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a lot of people say Stop I don't there. like Stop. iTunes, but whatever. Craig, where can people find out more about you? Uh, on GitHub, I am Booch, B-O-O-C-H. Uh, Twitter and almost everywhere else, Craig Buchek, C-R-A-I-G-B-U-C-H-E-K. Hey, John, did I see that we're part of the Stitcher Radio Network now? We are part of the Stitcher Radio Network. Where you can find podcasts like this and other great podcasts at stitcherradio.com. We're fi- where all fine podcasts are found. Jason Tice, where can folks find out more about you? And I know one great place at at the... Uh, <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> John, people Just can find me online Jason. at theagilefactor.com and also on Twitter, The Agile Factor. Yes. We solved that problem. It's solved. The we need to Factor. change it to the, the O Agile Factor because then we'll probably remember it. A little bit closer to the O'Reilly Factor and I think it'll work. No, I don't want to be... Well, None of that is copyrighted either. So luckily, I don't have to worry about being sued for borrowing a concept. They say <laughs> imitation is the most sincere form of flattery. So we'll see how this goes. Exactly. You guys can find me, John Sextro, at my blog, johnsextro.com. Or you can follow me on Twitter at JC Sextro. And like Amos said before, you can check out our website for the podcast, where we keep our show notes at thisagilelife.com. We love you all. And keep living this agile life. <laughs>